Without further ado, it is my pleasure, my honor, and my excited mental <laughs> stimulus to moderate this panel of fine individuals changing the face of transportation, not only here in Tampa, but potentially around the world. How many people here wish they had a flying car? Yeah, like we saw that stuff on the Jetsons. I actually distinctly remember a moment when I was probably five years old and my father looking at me in complete earnest and said, we will be in flying cars in 20 years. I full-blown believed him. It's more than 20 years ago now. Spoiler. And I, uh, I'm sorry that we're not there. So hopefully we can figure out how we're going to get there. And uh, we'll start with you, Stephen. Why don't you introduce yourself, let everybody know what you're up to, and also what is your favorite car of all time? Hmm. Um, well, let me start with who I am and what I'm up to, and then we'll get to the car part. Uh, Stephen Paulzine, I'm with the Center for Urban Transportation Research at USF, uh, uh, where I've been since about 1988, so a long time. Uh, I do transportation policy research, a civil engineer by training, um, and I've done a lot of work over the last several years <coughs> on travel behavior and travel data, uh, and not surprisingly, uh, with all of the changes now, um, it's been fascinating as a policy wonk, we're living in a target-rich area because the world is changing fast and some of those changes are technology and demographics and economics and, and that's spilling over in very big ways into transportation. So I've had a blast watching all the changes and thinking about what they mean for the future. Um, favorite car, probably uh, I had a 1975 Volkswagen Rabbit that uh, I spent 50% of its purchase price on repairs the first year, so they did under warranty, so, but it was fun, so. Sweet little convertible. Yes, yes, yes fun guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, good afternoon, everyone sitting like out there. Um, so I'm Catherine Egan. I'm the CEO of your transit agency here in Hillsborough County. Heart, everybody give some love for Heart, some love, please. <laughs> there are no cat calls, it's very disappointing. Um, <laughs> so I've been in Tampa six years. I came here from Baltimore, which has the 15th biggest transit agency in the country. You wouldn't think that, right? Like, what do you think Baltimore? I don't know what you think about maybe John Waters movies, but not a lot of transit. And before that, Dallas. I tell you that so, just so you know, I have some transit bona fides and a favorite car. I'm completely car illiterate. But my favorite car I had was a Beetle convertible because it was very cute. And when I went under underpasses, I could feel the urban heat seat baking on me. Very frightening experience. Oh, yes. It was kind of cool, though. Old school Volkswagen. Yeah. So far. Yeah, I know. Leading the pack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Steve, you going to shake it up for us down there? Or what's going on? Absolutely. I'm tired of the VW type thing going on around here. <laughs> yeah. Um, nice car, but not fun. I actually, um, I'm Steve Anderson. Uh, I'm an attorney here in Tampa, private practice. Uh, but the reason I'm here is that I've been representing Lyft, Inc. Uh, for the last couple of years uh, here in Florida. Uh, most of you have read and you understand what that has meant for me uh, for those uh, almost two years is fighting with uh, cab companies and uh, the Public Transportation Commission to, to uh, establish our right to, um, to offer services to the public and, uh, and, and generate that uh, incredible uh, innovation that Lyft and Uber have, uh, have created. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of favorite car, I did have a 69 um, a Beetle that took me all the way through law school, but it was not my favorite car. Um, <laughs> actually, my favorite car was an 83 Jag XJS. Oh, um, nice. Convertible, had 12 cylinders. Unfortunately, I was never able to use the tops, top uh, four. There's no place in Florida you can go that fast. So anyway, I love transportation. I love uh, representing Lyft. They are so innovative. They're so out there, uh, they won't even tell me what they're thinking. You know, <laughs> so it's pretty incredible what they've got going. How many people in the audience have taken a Lyft or a rideshare vehicle at some point? Sweet, so most of you. And how many people have taken the bus? Legitimate, that's great. Nice. Yeah, how many people have gone to a class in a school? Kidding, that was just a pun. <laughs> <laughs> So I think what's really interesting is you all, and, and, and about transportation in general, is in the past we have the Fords and the Chevys, and it's very, it's very siloed. It's very, the, the infrastructure is very invisible, and the brands are very out in front. But I think as we're seeing the paradigm shift in how we get around and how humans are concentrated in urban areas, and just a general shift in 
transportation behavior, we're starting to see the need for collaboration. So, and you're all from different places, so this is awesome, and you were all chit-chatting like you talk to each other on a pretty regular basis backstage, which is great. And so I'm curious, and um, let's start with you, Catherine, on this one. Who needs to collaborate to make the future of transportation possible? What big bodies of the earth and small local bodies need to make it happen? So I'm gonna say it's not the big bodies, because that's not where the change is gonna come from. Like we're, we're good, for us as a transit industry, for instance, we're really, really good at big vehicles. Like we have this whole thing carved out between safety standards and operator standards and collective bargaining agreements and paper schedules. Like the big investment is there. It's gonna be that small idea that pops up. I mean, who would have thought five years ago that there would have been anything like ride share? which now is turning into conversations like, you guys up on these things of car share, but not like a zip car, like fractional car ownership. So instead of buying a car, you would buy a part of a car and you go in in a pool with folks that you're looking at offset schedules. I mean, this, like it didn't even exist five years ago. There was, it, so it won't be the big bodies collaborating, but it, it would behoove the big bodies to get it together to be flexible. So for instance, for us, and I think in the transit industry in general, the bus company goes away and we turn into a mobility broker, pulling all the different solutions together. Because I'm not really good at innovative. I mean, Marco, we're awesome, right? But we're not the innovators. But we should let the innovators, you know, come up with that solution and we can knit it together and we can provide the framework. Yeah, adopt Remember? that solution yeah. as it happens versus mm -hmm. having to create it internally. Yeah, because why would we? I mean, again, we're great with the big buses, but someone else will kill the ride share with the technology. Uh, so why wouldn't we want to cooperate with that? Yeah. Yeah. Steve, I know you've obviously been doing a lot of talking with different folks to make things happen for Lyft. Uh, uh, today aside, bigger picture, who needs to come together? Actually, I'd say that um, everybody involved in personal transportation is, is going to have to rethink where they are and start collaborating with everybody else. Lyft and Uber need to start collaborating. Cab companies are not going to exist in five years. Uber and Lyft may not exist as, as they are today in five years, but you know, the legislature obviously needs to get its act together. That would be a, a huge benefit if they started acting on behalf of um, transportation and, and the public rather than, than their own special interests. But um, yeah, I think that uh, uh, we're going to see agencies like Hart dealing um, with the public or the private entities like Lyft and Uber. I mean, we're already trying to, to connect the, the first and the last mile, and you're making great progress on that. Taking a bus has always been a problem for most people, myself included. But if you can get a cheap ride to the bus and a cheap ride home from the bus, that's phenomenal. That's collaboration, that's what we need to be doing. Yeah. But it's gonna go, you know, we'll talk about this more, but where we are today, uh, it's amazing to me the, uh, the innovation that's already happening. Lyft and Uber are both uh, children of, of, of one little innovation, an app, but they are so far down the road already thinking about uh, the next five or six steps. Well, I'm sure we'll get into that. Excellent. Have anything to add there, Stephen? Yeah, I do. Um, and there's a lot of folks that are watching that and speculating on what happens. And when mm -hmm. I look at the the evolution, um, the ultimate evolution is really beyond the rideshare concepts to all fully automated vehicles ultimately. And, and so we're going through a transition. We've all had navigation systems and cell phones and now app-based technology and ultimately sensors and full deployment. Um, and so there's really some, some profound uh, distortions or disruptions in the industry in, in really many industries and um, you're seeing a whole different set of actors and players you've got uh, not only Uber and Lyft but the Googles and the Apples and the uh, other folks with with big bank accounts big global clout um, you've got the old line auto industry you've got the regulatory and bureaucratic folks you've got industries like insurance and public transit and taxi cab um, and and it's going to take some time to digest all that and to see what uh, relationships and partnerships um, fall out. And the history of technology deployment is uh, uh, sometimes full of false starts. I use, for example, the uh, situation with red light cameras that, you know, if you back up 10 years, you know, oh, neat, technology, digital recognition, quick cameras, uh, uh, we're going to have improved safety. And, and yet, 
in a lot of places, they blew that. They didn't execute effectively. Uh, it was, there was some abusive practices taking place. They're being pulled in lots of locations. Um, the public didn't really benefit like they could have. Um, and so we need to make sure we do it right. And that's not easy because there's a lot of places, a lot of money at stake, a lot of big egos at stake, um, a lot of, of turf and history. So it's, it's not an easy process going forward. No, I think, I think that's... A really good point, and and the you know at, uh, at least where I in Silicon Valley land, there's kind of a running joke that infrastructure isn't sexy, but we can't do anything without it. And I, th I think most people know that. But what you're talking about is it really will be a, a shift. It's not just going to be one bus service. It'll be five different ways of getting you a little point A to point B, and maybe an electric scooter comes and gets you the last mile because it's uphill or it's narrow or whatever. You never know what's going to happen. Um, so. In terms of user behavior and, and how that's going to drive this shift as we move forward, I got my license on my 16th birthday and holy moly was I proud and excited and freedom and probably broke 15 laws in the first 15 minutes and had friends hanging out my sunroof and the whole shebang. Uh, but I realized my children may not have that experience. And I'm curious, what is the, the future for the the driver behavior, the user behavior of the, and whether they're a driver or someone transporting themselves somewhere, where are we going physically? How are we gonna change? Okay. Um, let me take a shot at that because I, I watch travel behavior closely. Um, and of course, a lot of these technologies are still emerging and um, we do have some anecdotal data or some limited case studies, mostly the early experience in California. Uh, and we've got some sense of what's happening uh, in the, and they are taking uh, travelers from auto, <laughs> bus, walk, uh, and, and generating, inducing some more trips. Um, so we're starting to see some of that and getting some sense. Um, but most of those contexts are fairly early adapters, uh, unique. Uh, environments, etc. Um, the broader issue of how fast uh, uh, behaviors will morph, we're really looking at transportation potentially moving from a, a pretty much an individually determined vehicle ownership and use and behavior pattern um, to turning transportation into a service. And folks talk that in the future this will be like a bundled cable service or bundled cell phone service where you might have an account and, and get you know anything from Uber automated vehicle rides to airline points to inner city bus tickets to public transit rides, et cetera. Um, and so that's at least one model of, of where we're going. Um, not everybody will move in that direction at the same speed, um, and we don't really know how fast or how long uh, that will happen. There's some very significant kind of behavior changes potentially um, along the way. I look at several of them. One is the auto ownership issue. Um, how much will this uh, minimize auto ownership? And uh, those of us that study that are interested in that because then all of a sudden your decisions are based on marginal cost. Uh, it, it, or, or no longer based, or based on full cost as opposed to marginal cost uh, if you have a sunk cost of owning a vehicle. So um, that's a significant change. Uh, the next thing we look at is it going to change where you live, work type of situations and uh, is, is that going to happen. Uh, and finally the third piece that's really important, particularly for folks worried about environment and other things, um, is are you willing to share rides and if so under what conditions and with who and for what types of trip purposes, et cetera. Uh, are we going to fill up more than, than one seat in a vehicle? Um, we're right now at 1.67 on average and um, you know we've got a lot of empty seats moving around uh, in both personal vehicles and public transit and uh, is this technology going to help us fill those and will be people ride together? So those are kind of the, the areas of behavior change that, that we're paying attention to. Um, the verdict's not out, but there's certainly some evidence that behaviors are changing. Yeah. Steve, if I could, um, I'd like to add to that a little bit. You know, driverless cars, I think it'd be great. Uh, and obviously it's coming, but I think it'll be a long time. That's not, I mean, that is a long-term situation <laughs> because of the technology, the infrastructure, and everything else. I think it's great. There are some obvious, there's some obvious things that have, ha that have happened right now. But between now and the midterm, not even getting to long term, there are some behavioral changes already occurring. Uh, interesting um, tidbit uh, that in the cities where Lyft and Uber are operating, ride sharing, let's just call them ride sharing, uh, drunk driving is down 20%. Whoa. It's huge. It's huge. 
That's why Mother's you know, Mad uh, endorses the concept. Uh, you know, we've all got experiences with, uh, with you know, ourselves or our, our kids that uh, now use those kinds of ride-sharing opportunities when they're going out and having a party. That's a huge, that's a huge modification in, in, our, in our behavior. Car ownership and the use of the sole car, I think, is going to change pretty dramatically. And I think, um, you know, some examples of that. Consider this. General Motors just invested $500 million in Lyft. Ooh. Now, if a huge auto company is going that direction, what does that tell you? Because those people don't sit around thinking about yesterday. They're thinking about 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when they realize that the ride sharing and the other uh, innovations are going to drive car ownership down. So what is General Motors looking at down the road? They've already got a pilot program for the near term, near to midterm. Well, you come into a, and, or even if you live in a city or you're traveling to a city uh, and you get around from hotel to meeting or from the airport to the hotel on a, um, uh, on a ride sharing plan, Lyft or Uber or whatever's out there. But you need to take a one day trip uh, out to the country uh, or to a manufacturing site 20 miles away. You use the same app that uh, you use to get uh, into town with uh, Lyft or Uber. Uh, you click on, on the General Motors app and it will pinpoint five locations within almost walking distance where you can go to get a General Motors car, a rental car. You open the car with the app, uh, keys are in it, you drive the car, and you, you're billed automatically just like you are in ride-sharing programs. So that's where General Motors thinks we're going in the kind of the near term. Uh, but I think clearly the long-term effect of all of this is less cars, less car ownership, less cars on the road, less gasoline wasted, less road construction uh, needed, and things of that nature. Yeah, and Savannah, I think one point that comes back to me a lot on this is the decisions the, the, the factors which are going to drive the change and the folks making the decision are like this, right? That's through a Venn diagram. Um, and the example I'll give, I think it's fantastic that folks can go out and have their cocktails and take a rideshare home, because uh, that's what I did Wednesday, took off the afternoon. <laughs> but I have, um, everybody, come on, like no one here has ever done that. I, the head of planning and service development for us is a 62-year-old guy from Iowa, and he mm -hmm. loves Breaking Bad. Did anyone here watch Breaking Bad? Like, I kind oh, yeah. of did. He loved it. Loved it. And when it went off the air, he was bored, and so he went to work for Lyft. And it was market research, too, but it filled up his time. And there's, I'm condensing it, this big, long story, and the short version was he wasn't just carrying, you know, hipsters or empty nesters who wanted to be chic. He was doing evening grocery trips for folks with cerebral palsy who could not oh. drive, but transit wasn't attractive because, frankly, to use us, if you have a disability, it's, it, you have to really try to take it. And this conversation made him think, rideshare isn't a marginal method of transportation, it's the first step to a totally different universe. And had he not driven, we wouldn't know that because we're all driving in our cars, right? But this is not unusual. We see this with uh, environmental stewardship. There's a huge break from 35 and under. Folks who are 35 and under think we're recycling, that we are paying extra attention to petroleum products, that we are converting to CNG because it's the right thing for the planet. There is a generational shift of, but you should just be doing that, right? Same thing in this cohort of folks who aren't getting driver's licenses as quickly. It's much easier to accommodate behavior if you never had a car than it is to give your car up. Mm -hmm. So folks who are over 35, not living this way, are making the decisions <coughs> and this huge generation which is gonna consume those services coming and just expecting those needs to be met. So I think that's one of our challenges is how do you integrate that? How do you take the power to influence what an agency is doing and match it to what the market is really saying folks want? Yeah. And I'm wondering, uh, maybe Steve has some information on this. Uh, you talk about uh, the older people. Um, what impact Over is all 35. this, what, is, what impact is the aging of America gonna have on this? Uh, you know, the, the folks my age, um, we still get around a lot. I mean, I'm, I work every day and, you know, have a pretty active life otherwise. And, and there's this whole generation of, uh, of folks that are reaching that age where they don't want to be driving too much anymore. It's a hassle. And you got to go park in the garage. You got to do all that stuff. What, how is this going to impact 
that age group? Or let me reverse it. How's that age group going to impact this transportation issue? The, uh, a, a couple things. Um, one is there's always a tendency to kind of stereotype <coughs> generations and age groups and everything. Um, and we do see in travel behavior a kind of diversity of behavior across all kinds of segments. Um, and particularly in seniors, we did some work a number of years ago about relinquishing driver's licenses. And, um, and in a focus group, we had uh, uh, one person who poo pooed uh, cell phones, and I never, I grew up, you know, I lived 80 years productively without that, I don't need that. And, and another woman had hers out on the table so all of her friends could see it because she was very proud of the fact that she was tech savvy and had learned how to use a cell phone. And, and so we're going to see that variation in behaviors. It, it's certainly an asset. Generally, people don't drive the last seven years of their life is kind of if you have to characterize it. Um, and, and so there's a period of time there where um, they are dependent often on others. And if this is a viable option, um, and, and, and it certainly can be, um, that's certainly attractive to, to, to those folks and can um, particularly when, when oftentimes they own a car and literally put a thousand or two thousand miles a year on it um, and they could save that cost and risk and worry, um, et cetera. So it's certainly an opportunity. Um, the, the next senior generations will probably be tech savvy. There's certainly some of them uh, that already are, but we're moving in that direction uh, with time. So we're certainly likely to see that. Um, and it may, for example, oftentimes seniors kind of self-police themselves on driving. They'll restrict it to less busy roads, daylight hours, good weather, off-peak travel, et cetera. Um, and, and so they're constraining themselves with, with those conditions. And, and this gives them an option, perhaps, to not have to do those uh, self-discipline things to, to their comfort zone uh, on driving because they can be dependent upon somebody else. H having said that, even the millennials <laughs> Um, you know, there's a, it's a diverse society. We've got huge shares of the millennial population that are dropping out of, of high school, not getting degrees. If you take our three biggest states, you know, Texas, California, and Florida, they all have about a somewhere between a quarter and a third don't finish high school. You know, these folks aren't playing with smartphones and living in condos downtown and living exciting lifestyles. And, and so we need to, to look at mobility opportunities and technologies that can serve the full spectrum of the population. Um, and different groups have different um, acceptance levels or willingness to, to, to use and take advantage of these new services. Um, and, and these services are relatively immature. I mean, we haven't been through a full economic cycle. Uh, we've still got, uh, you know, I was teasing one of the Uber executives a, a few months ago about, you know, literally every week their business model ch or pricing changes. They've got a new brand, a new feature, a new price. Um, and so it, for, for us folks trying to predict the future, uh, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to do that because you know, it's a very dynamic world, and particularly the pricing, whether or not the, the supply and demand balance works and at what price point it works, and if it works with $2 gas, will it work with $5 gas, and et cetera. Um, that's a key issue, and, and then the trip sharing is also a key issue. Um, we could, in fact, have more vehicles on the road because there's empty miles between trips um, versus, you know, point-to-point -point service with a personal vehicle. Um, so unless the sharing meaning sharing the ride, not sharing the vehicle sequentially. Unless that happens, there's some real impacts to the transportation system.